BestBookBits.com presents Becoming Steve Jobs, The Evolution of a Reckless Upstart into a Visionary Leader. The number one New York Times bestselling biography of how Steve Jobs became the most visionary CEO in history. Becoming Steve Jobs breaks down the conventional one-dimensional view of Steve Jobs that he was a half-genius, half-jerk from youth, an irascible and selfish leader who slighted friends and family alike. Becoming Steve Jobs answers the central question about life and career of the Apple co-founder and CEO. How did a young man so reckless and arrogant that he was exiled from the company he founded become the most effective visionary business leader of our time? Ultimately transforming the daily life of billions of people. A rich and revealing account. Becoming Steve Jobs shows us how one of the most colorful and compelling figures of our times was able to combine his unchanging relentless passion with an evolution in management style to create one of the most valuable and beloved companies on the planet. The written and audio summary can be found on our website, bestbookbits.com. So without further ado, I bring the book summary of Becoming Steve Jobs. Book summary. What's in it for me? Learn the epic story behind one of tech's true innovators. Steve Jobs epitomizes the daring and creativity of the tech industry's pioneering entrepreneurs. Idolized by many, he has become an almost mythological figure, a night crusading for innovation and immaculate design. As CEO of Apple, Jobs created one of the most valuable and admired companies in the world, and along with it, a series of amazing products, including the iPhone. But who exactly was the man behind the myth? A good many tales have been told. Some saw Jobs as a genius and visionary leader, while others thought he was a pompous jerk, a single-minded perfectionist, or a stubborn half-genius, half asshole. This is a story of how Steve Jobs became the Steve Jobs we think of today. You will also find out how Apple got its name, what role Pixar played in Jobs becoming back to Apple, and how Jobs made some of the last great products while fighting death. Summary part one, Steve Jobs had an early knack for technology. Steve Jobs was born on February 24th, 1955 in San Francisco. And shortly thereafter, he was put up for adoption by his biological mother, Joanna Schiebel. As a result, he grew up the son of Paul and Clara Jobs a working class couple. Being adopted by Paul and Clara may have greatly contributed to his later work since Jobs quickly developed a keen understanding of technology. Because his father was a car mechanic and craftsman who made furniture, there was a workbench in the family garage and Jobs' father taught him how to build things, take them apart and put them back together again. This education served him well later in life. When showing the iPod to the author, Jobs reminisced about how his father told him to work as diligently on the underside of a cabinet as on its finish. Jobs was also smart as a whip. He skipped sixth grade and was naturally drawn to math and science. Because of his demonstrated skill in these subjects, he was accepted into the Explorers Club, a group of kids who worked on electronics projects on the Hewlett Packard campus. It was here that Jobs used a computer for the first time. He was clearly precocious, so it's no surprise that he was just 21 years old when he and Steve Wozniak founded Apple. Here's what happened. The pair met in 1969 when a friend introduced Jobs to Wozniak, or Woz, as an engineering genius and the son of a Lockheed Martin engineer. At the time, computing was anything but personal and computers didn't even have keyboards or monitors. Woz recognized these shortcomings and Jobs knew they could build a better computer for home use. So they set up in Jobs' parents' garage and began working on their first model, the Apple I. They invited in a few kids from the neighborhood to assemble it and pretty soon they had a miniature assembly line going. They named the new company Apple, a nod to both the Garden of Eden and an Oregon apple orchard and commune that Jobs frequented after high school. Summary part two, Apple quickly churned out a second computer and the company began one of the fastest growing startups in history. In founding his own company and designing the Apple One, Jobs had discovered his purpose in life. He and Wozniak even convinced a local small business owner to distribute their machines. Soon enough, they were selling a dozen computers every few weeks. Fewer than 200 units of the first model were ever sold, but this success was nevertheless energizing. Riding the momentum of their first attempt and Wozniak's assurance that he could build a much better machine, they went to work on their second computer, the Apple II. To fully realize Wozniak's plan, however, they needed some serious capital, a problem they soon solved when Jobs won over AC, Mike Muckula, a former Intel executive. This angel investor handed the pair a then whopping $92,000 out of his own pocket and set up a $250,000 line of credit for the young company. Beyond that, Muckula also hired Michael Scotty Scott, 
who would become Apple's first professional CEO, and the company moved out of Jobs' family garage and into the real office in Cupertino. There, with a few new professional assistants and startup money, they focused on their vision to build a truly personal computer. In 1977, their hard work paid off, and the Apple II was released. The new model came out with a significantly faster microprocessor, which boosted performance along with an audio amplifier and speaker, as well as inputs for a gaming joystick. But more importantly, as it was designed to be a personal computer, it didn't make the frightening sounds of an industrial machine, and it came packed in a single, manageable box. In combination, all these features made it a huge retail success. Pretty soon, Apple was one of the fastest growing startups in history. In fact, soon after Apple II was released, in April of 1977, the company was selling some 500 computers every month. From there, their sales rose from 7.8 million in 1978 to an incredible 48 million in 1979. However, this rosy financial picture obscured a number of issues, which you'll learn about in the next book summary. Summary part three, a series of product failures resulted in Jobs' forced exile. In the late 1970s, Jobs' life was a roller coaster. He was in his early 20s and had been thrown himself full throttle into his career, foregoing a social life and even going without sleep. In many ways, it paid off, and when Apple went public in 1980, Jobs' shares made him worth $256 million. However, by icing out early contributors like Bill Ferdinand and Daniel Kotke, Jobs isolated himself within the company, and then he and Wozniak began to grow apart. Jobs was in urgent need of another breakthrough product, but the company simply couldn't deliver. First, in 1980, they came out with the Apple III, the successor of the much-lauded Apple II. However, unlike its predecessor, the third model was an absolute disaster. It had an insane price tag of $4,340 and was prone to catastrophic overheating. After the Apple III came the Lisa, a computer developed for businesses and introduced in 1983. It was the first computer to utilize a graphical user interface, or GUI which meant it had a desktop symbols that users could click on to open programs and files. Unfortunately, since Jobs was intent on making their computer accessible to individual users rather than businesses, it was as much a failure as the Apple III. Then in 1984, the company released the Macintosh. While it was initially celebrated by the media for its beautiful graphics, it was clearly too underpowered to be truly useful and sales of the product missed the mark by a wide margin. Such a stream of failures meant serious trouble for Jobs. In fact, the situation was so dire that in 1985, he was forced into exile from his own company. The CEO at the time, John Scully, made Jobs step down as the head of the Mac product division, and Jobs retaliated by trying to get Scully fired. In the end, he couldn't get the support he needed from the company board and was forced to walk away from Apple himself. Nonetheless, Jobs was more determined than ever to create the next big thing. Summary part four, after leaving Apple, Jobs continued trying to revolutionize technology, but with little success. Though forced out of Apple, Jobs was not about to give up. He was ready to plot his tech revolution, and with investors and the media hailing him as a genius, he was certain he could be a great CEO. He was also certain that he was the only person alive who could create such amazing products. So in 1985, he founded the company Next, but success didn't come as readily as he assumed it would. The firm started out with the idea of developing a computer geared toward the specific needs of higher education market, catering to universities and academic professionals. The academics Jobs spoke with told him they couldn't afford a penny above $3,000, and he, when Next finally released its first computer in 1988, the retail cost was a shocking $6,500, and that wasn't even the total cost for a fully functioning Next system. For the full works, users were really looking at something closer to $10,000. Naturally, at this price, the product had no chance. The product's demise is actually a good example of a general tendency Jobs had. He was so driven by innovation that he seemed practically incapable of noting the trade-offs that his choices necessitated. For instance, he chose an optical disk drive for the storage of information rather than a more conventional hard drive. The disk drive had certain perks, like the ability to store 200 times more information and the option for removal from the computer. However, pulling information off an optical drive was impossibly slow, and nobody actually needed a removable drive. Things weren't going well at Next, but Jobs also had another project. He became the major owner of Pixar. This firm was the computer subdivision of the Lucasfilm, which was responsible for the incredibly special effects in movies like Star Trek II and young Sherlock Holmes. 
the company caught Job's attention because of the high-tier software they developed for the manipulation of 3D images. When all was said and done, it would be his experience at Pixar that would lead him back to Apple. Summary Part 5, in the early 1990s, Microsoft dominated the computer industry, but success at Pixar reinvigorated Steve Jobs. While Jobs struggled to pull together his vision for Next, which was drifting disastrously, another tech star was rising. This was Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft. During the 1990s, his company was dominating the industry as Next and Apple alike began fading into the past. In fact, by 1991, Microsoft was already the world's leading software company. This might have had something to do with the fact that while Apple and Next didn't license their operating systems for manufacturers, Microsoft's operating system Windows became the industry standard for every personal computer not produced by the other two companies. This wide appeal rocketed Gates into the elite circle of the super rich, but it also made clear the fundamental differences between him and Jobs. For instance, Jobs was always set on creating the best, most aesthetically pleasing and innovative machines possible. Gates, on the other hand, didn't care much for revolutionizing the computer industry. Rather, he wanted to ensure reliability and gradual improvements, which is exactly what millions of corporate customers also craved. Because of this difference, Gates became arguably the most important business person on the planet, while Jobs looked on from the sidelines. But that would all change as the success of Pixar gave Jobs new confidence. Here's what happened. In 1995, Pixar partnered with Disney to produce its first animated film, The Toy Story, which went on to be a smash success. This masterstroke also coincided with Pixar's initial public offering, making Jobs, who own 80% of the company, shares a billionaire overnight. Oddly enough, the release of the animated film for children is what catalyzed Jobs' rise from the dead. It boosted his confidence, and his experience at Pixar also taught him about good management. During his tenure at the company, he learned from John Laster and Ed Catmull, both of whom ditched micromanagement at Pixar, enabling their creative employees to run with the freedom they needed. Summary Part 6, returning to Apple in 1997, Steve Jobs put the company back on track. So the release of Toy Story put Jobs back in the spotlight. Nonetheless, Next was still struggling. The company pr products weren't selling, and Jobs' dream that the company would produce the world's next great computers was toast. It was by far the low point of his career. Things were so bad that Jobs shut down production entirely, shifting the company's focus to software development, specifically its operating system. Next Step, which was at least brought into a small profit, but in the situation with Next sounds dire, just wait until you hear what was going on with Apple. By the mid-1990s, the company was effectively a sinking ship. It had no promising products in the pipeline and was still failing to modernize its operating system. Beyond that, Apple had way more employees than it could offer. As a result, in the first quarter of 1996 alone, the company lost $750 million. Jobs watched the downfall of the company from a distance, but it pained for him nevertheless. And then an unforeseen opportunity popped up. Apple, in search of a shortcut to a more advanced operating system and a way out of its crisis, was looking for software companies to acquire. Jobs threw his hat into the ring, and in the late 1996, Apple purchased Next. Just like that, Jobs was back at Apple. Over the years that followed, he worked hard to re-establish Apple as a profitable computer industry leader. This process began with the forced resignation of the CEO, Jill Admilo, who Jobs described as a bozo. With Admilio out of the picture, Jobs was also offered the position and retook the reins. Though finally back in power, Jobs was initially indecisive, which was the first for him. In fact, during the last few years, he had largely overcome his impulsive tendencies, leaning to make more careful, measured decisions. Thankfully, this initial indecision didn't last, and by 2000, Apple was shipping out tons of groundbreaking products, including the iMac and the Power Mac. It was this technological innovation that remade the company and brought it out of the red. But how exactly did Jobs accomplish this? You'll find out in the next book summary. Summary part 7. With the development of the iTunes and the iPod, Apple entered the mass market and rebuilt itself. So Jobs succeeded in transforming Apple from a deeply troubled company into a soaring business. But how exactly? First, he trimmed down to the size that was appropriate for its resources. In the process, thousands of employees were laid off, but Jobs was also to, able to inspire those who stayed to buckle down and create a whole new line of incredible products. He did this by steering the company in a clear direction, focusing on no more than four basic products. The company produced two desktop PC models and two laptop models, 
one model for each pair directed at consumers, the other at professionals. Such focus laid the foundation for the company's comeback, but the true innovation began in 2001 when Apple launched iTunes, a software that for the first time ever let users create digital music archives and put together personal playlists in a simple, easy to use way. But what was even more important about iTunes is that it led to the development of the iPod. Introduced in the fall of 2001, this MP3 player was Apple's first foray into the mass market of consumer electronics. At the time, pocket-sized MP3 players existed, but were mostly poorly designed. It was difficult to put music on them and hard to find what you wanted to listen to. The iPod changed all of that. It was a truly usable device, in large part because of its user interface and its unique thumb wheel, which lets users intuitively scroll through their music collections. Customers instantly fell in love with the device and sales soared. Then in 2003, the company built an iTunes music store into the software and opened up iTunes for Windows users as well, taking a further step into the market. The addition of music store was huge. It gave users a simple and fairly priced option for buying albums and singles that they otherwise had to download illegally. It was so successful that by the end of 2003, Apple had sold over 25 million songs. The company was back on the rise. Summary Part 8, when Steve Jobs fought cancer, Apple continued to soar. In his 49 years, Jobs had never experienced a serious medical condition. But then in 2003, he was diagnosed with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Luckily, the tumor turned out to be slow growing and more treatable than was first thought. However, while the Stanford doctors that Jobs enlisted told him he needed immediate surgery, Jobs himself wasn't so sure. Ignoring their advice, he opted first for alternatives, less invasive treatment, and augmented diet. This route was insufficient, however, and in 2004, without any op options moved, this operation was wholly invasive, and Jobs spent practically an entire day on the operating table. Worse still, it took him for a full month to get back into the office post-surgery, and though the surgery was successful, it uncovered another serious medical problem. Surgeons detected a series of cancerous metastasizers, secondary tumors growing on his liver. At the same time, during 2003 and 2004, Apple continued to surge. Sales from iTunes and iPod kept climbing. It was just three years after the launch of iTunes, but revenue related to the store and MP3 player already made up 19% of Apple's total sales. In 2004 alone, the company sold 4.4 million iPods, which brought in a net income of 276 million, a dramatic jump from the 69 million of the previous year. Not just that, but Apple's entire product line, including its laptops and desktops, was upgraded during those two years. It also didn't hurt that Apple simultaneously launched its own internet browser called Safari and released a cool new application called GarageBand that could be used for simple music recordings and editing. When Jobs came back to office, it was the relentless drive to improve and innovate. Unsurprisingly, as the result of that innovation is arguably Apple's most revolutionary product to date, the iPhone. Next up, you'll learn how this game-changing product was born. Summary Part 9, the release of the iPhone changed technology forever. In 2007, there was already existed devices that were being described as smartphones, like the Blackberry and the Palm Trio. All of them were fine for checking email, finding a contact in your address book, or checking your calendar. But when the iPhone first hit shelves that summer, it clearly offered something different. In many ways, it was the world's first truly smartphone. What really set the iPhone apart was its full-size touchscreen, which made making a call as easy as swiping a finger. The larger screen also enabled users to view full-featured websites, photos and videos in a way previous phones hadn't. Another difference was that while the existing smartphones all had a massive fixed keyboard, the iPhone didn't have a built-in keyboard at all. Instead, the keys only displayed on the screen when needed. How did this incredible innovation come into existence? Apple had actually been tinkering with the touchscreen technology since 2002, but for different reasons, their hope at the time had to be find a more intuitive way for users to interact with computers beyond the confines of a keyboard and mouse. And they began experimenting with multi-touch, as the technology is called. They found that it was both fun and effective. In another sense, the iPhone was just a natural progression from the iPod combining a phone, an iPod, and a computer into single, beautifully designed product. That all being said, the phone did have an initial problem. Because of Apple's refusal to allow outside developers to build applications, they weren't a ton of apps to choose from. 
It was only in November of 2007 that Apple revealed its intention to release a software developer kit, which had been the greatest breakthrough of the product offered. All of a sudden, anyone who wanted to could create apps, making the iPhone truly versatile. As a result, the iPhone remains the most successful consumer electronics product in history. Over half a billion iPhones have been sold since 2007, and of course, Apple has profited tremendously. Summary Part 10, the iPad and the MacBook Air were Steve Jobs' final accomplishments. So Apple was doing better than ever, but the same couldn't be said of Jobs. His cancer never went away, and his health was declining. But despite this fact, his illness was never overshadowed the daily business of Apple. While the board of directors began to discuss succession plans for most people at Apple, Jobs' decline in health was a total mystery. After all, even as his health deteriorated and he knew time was running out, Jobs refused to give up. Because of his dedication, the company released the MacBook Air in 2008 and two years later the iPad. At the same time, the former product was Apple's new IT device. It was thinner than any previous laptop, effectively the computer equivalent of a supermodel. From there, the iPad further revolutionized the industry in 2010. If the iPhone was a miniaturized computer, the iPad was a blown up iPhone. When it was released, Jobs unveiled its functions while comfortably sitting on a couch, demonstrating how easy it was to use. And in fact, the iPad did offer a much more intimate experience than a laptop, easily bringing computing into the living room. This casual presentation was perfect, but it was also necessitated by Jobs' poor health. He had lost an alarming amount of weight, and the prospect of death was becoming undeniable. In early 2009, he received a liver transplant, but it was to no avail. And on Tuesday, October 5, 2011, Steve Jobs passed away. As you might imagine, the funeral services were magnificent. When he was buried on October 8, there was a small ceremony, family, close friends, and companions from Apple. But another service followed on October 17 at the Memorial Church on Stanford University campus, and then another on October 20 at the Apple headquarters in Cupertino, with almost 10,000 people in attendance. Following Jobs' burial, his longtime colleague and friend, Tim Cook, took over as CEO of Apple and has continued to advance Jobs' legacy, a legacy of growth, success, creativity, and innovation. In review, Becoming Steve Jobs' book summary, the key message in this book, the life of Steve Jobs is a story of success, innovation, and growth. Even from his early age, Jobs had a talent for technology, and when he co-founded Apple in his 20s, he had already had a vision of what computers could become. Though a sometimes impulsive and difficult man, he was also a dreamer and trailblazer and is an inspiration to millions worldwide. And that's a wrap on Becoming Steve Jobs book summary. Check out a YouTube channel with over 450 book summaries uploaded previously. Like the video, comment on what you think, subscribe for the channel for more videos to come. And if there's a book you want me to do a summary on, comment below. Check out our website, bestbookbits.com, where you'll find 450 written book summaries where you can download in the PDF to read offline in video categories such as biographies, business and marketing, habits, health, leadership, money, personal development, philosophy, psychology, real estate, relationship, sales, spirituality, success, time management, and travel. If you're into the audio podcast version, check out mixcloud.com forward slash bestbookbits, where you'll find 450 audiobook summaries to listen to at your pleasure. And last, follow us on Instagram for daily motivational quotes and book summaries. Thanks for watching and listening. Hope you got something out of this. Go out there, have yourself a great day. Take care. Bye-bye now.